What up, athletes? Whoop, whoop. All right, this is 12.4 part one. We'll be using this in conjunction with our toolkit, which is the above video and or below, I guess, if you're looking at it on YouTube, but it just depends uh, if you're going through cameras or not. Our learning target today is I will analyze and construct viable arguments. Go ahead and write that down and then take a minute, look at the warm up. You're just deciding whether or not these are true or false statements. Ready, set, go. Okay, I'm going to assume you pause this. Awesome, let's talk about it. So again, true or false, or valid or invalid argument. If an animal is a golden retriever, then it is a dog. Mac is a dog, therefore, Mac is a golden retriever. That's actually not a valid argument. That's invalid. And why is that? Uh, well... It says, if an animal is a golden retriever, then it is a dog. It doesn't say Mac is a golden retriever, therefore Mac is a dog. It just says Mac is a dog. Mac could be another kind of dog. It could be a wiener dog. It could be a, a boxer, a pit bull. We don't know. Uh, so that's an invalid argument. The temperature is below 32 degrees. If the temperature is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, then the water will freeze. The temperature is 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, the water will freeze. Yep. It's below 32, which means the water will freeze. That is a valid argument. All students stu must study. We can rewrite. Whenever you see these all statements, you can actually read that, rewrite that, say something kind of like this. If you are a student, this is my shorthand for student, then you will study. Okay? says the same thing. That's the same type of statement that we see right there. Uh, Emma studies. Well, Emma studies. Well, maybe she's a student. Maybe she just studies for fun. I don't know. Maybe she's studying for work. We don't know. But that doesn't mean she's a student. If she's a student, she must study. But her studying doesn't make her a student, which is what it says here. So that is an invalid argument. It doesn't work backwards. And then again, we have another similar statement. All trees have leaves. So another way I could say it is, if it is a tree, then it has leaves. An oak is a tree. All right, if it's a tree, then it has leaves. An oak has leaves. That is a valid argument. Oh. Okay. Uh, pause this if you need to, but we're going to move right on. We're going to kind of boot scoot through this. And again, I will be using the entire time through this video, this document, we've done our toolkit, and I'll refer to it often. You'll notice it says properties here. So before, uh, so we're going to be using the property section. Before we do that, we do have one vocab word, which is proof, which is what we're doing today. Uh, aren't you glad I didn't put those on there? Proof is a logical argument in which each statement is supported by a statement that is accepted as true. So in other words, uh, we use true statements, statements that are accepted as true, to provide a logical argument. Okay? Go ahead and pause if you need to. Again, we're just going to move right on with what we're rolling with here. And indicate which property justifies the given statement. Use the geometry toolkit. So if 5 equals x, then x equals 5. Let's go look for one that looks just like that. Uh, let's see. If 5 equals x, is there any that's in the x equals department? Right here, if x equals 3, then 3 equals x. That's the same thing, just different numbers, right? And what is that? That is matched with, if I follow that back, it's a, if a equals b, then b equals a. That's the symmetric property of equalities. Let's write that down. Symmetric property of equality. Okay, and I'll end up shorthanding these as we go. So if x equals 4 and 4 equals y, then x equals y. Let's do one more together. Let's go down. No, it's not really that. No, 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 no. Wait. If x equals 3 and 3 equals y, then x equals y. Well, that looks pretty similar. 
What is that? That is the transitive property of equality. Write down transitive drop of equality. Okay. Take a minute. See if you guys can fill in the blanks for the other two. You're actually finding the statements that match these and then filling in what's not there using their numbers. Ready, set, go. Okay, I'm going to assume you did this. So let's see. It says, uh, if blank, then x times 3 equals 4 times 3. Okay. Let's look right here. I would say it matches this right here, multiplication property of equality, which tells me if x equals 4, then x times 3 equals 4 times 3. I know I wrote it down a little differently on there. And then we see this one, x equals 5 plus 7. Then what? Well, let's look. Uh, if x equals 3... That's it, exactly. Let's go up here. I actually think... All right, this... I think this is the substitute property. If A equals B, then A may be replaced by B in any equation or expression. Which you see right here, if X equals 3 and Y equals 5X plus 2, and y equals 5 times 3 plus 2. It's a little different, but we're going to make that logical leap. So if x equals 5 plus 7, then what else does x equal? x equals 12 when we solve it. So we're using right there the substitute. Oh, I didn't even read it. Use the substitution property to complete this. Duh. I need to pay attention to my own documents, don't I? <laughs> all right. I like to leave these things in here because then you learn sometimes I don't read all the directions either and I need to. It hurts me when I don't. All right. So that's how we use our properties to help us, right? So at times we're going to be calling on properties to match them up or to use them to make logical leaps. So now I want to go into some postulates. And you should have written these down. We have the whole document of postulates. And it says explain how the photo illustrates the statement points D, E, and F form of plane is true. So first things first, we gotta, we got to notice some things. We're going to explain it out. Notice that we have this line L that contains points D and E. So we're going to say points D and E are on line L. But what do we also notice? Look at point F. F is not, it is not on line L. Therefore, we can say that points D, E, and F are non-collinear. So, why was that important? If we look at our postulate that talks about a plane, let's look at that. It says, through any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one plane. So what are we showing here? What postulate demonstrates that points D, E, and F form a plane, right? It takes three points to form a plane. And that's kind of this face of the building we see right here, right? This little... See that face of a building that's kind of making a plane going out right there? How do we know it forms a plane? Because we have three non-collinear points. And what postulate was that? That was postulate 3.2 that says that and demonstrates it right here. So we're going to say 3.2 tells us that through. the three points is exactly one plane. Is 
distance is represented by the side of the building. Ooh, you can't see this. I'm so sorry. I had to pay attention to that. This is represented by the side of the building. Boom. Let's take a minute. Pause it if you need to. Get this written down. As you can tell, proofs are going to be a little bit different. They're going to be a little heavy on the explanation side of things. Okay? We don't just say it and leave it. we got to explain it. All right. We're going to do more postulate work right here. So we're going to use the postulates to answer the following with always, sometimes, or never true. Line R contains only point P. Let's look at our theorem about lines. What does it say? Or our postulate. Through any two points, uh, there's exactly one line. Okay. Uh, how about this one? Let's look at 3.3. A line contains at least two points. Ooh. You see that? 3.3? A line contains... 3.3. A line contains at least two points. What does that mean? Let's look at this right here. It says line R contains only point P. Well, that can't be. So that's a never... And we know that because 3.3 says a line has at least two points. All right, through points H and K, there's exactly one line. Well, let's see. Let's go back to our list right here. Look at 3.1. Through any two points, there's exactly one line. That is always true because of 3.1. So always. And why? We only say because 3.1 says exactly one line goes through two points. All right, take a minute, see if you can do C and D, and then uh, we're just gonna take a look at them. Ready, set, go. All right, if two coplanar lines intersect and the points of intersection lie in the same plane as the two lines, so two coplanar lines intersect, then, so these two lines are coplanar, that means both lines are already in the same plane. Then the point of intersection lies in the same plane as the two points. Well, I'm going to tell you that isn't always true. And how do I know that? Well, let's look. If we look at postulate 3.5, it says if two points lie in a plane, then the entire line containing those points lie in the plane. So this tells me that that line and all the points in it lie in the plane. So if I have two lines that lie in a plane, right? Then all the points containing those lines lie in that plane, which means that point of intersection is also in that plane. So why 3.5 says if the lines lie in a plane, all of the points do. as well. And I know you guys may not be giving exactly these descriptions like I am, or maybe they're not as detailed, or maybe you're just barely getting on to the postulate doing it. That's okay. This is a start. I'm giving you, I've done this for a lot of years, so I'm able to do this. Okay. Four points are non-collinear. That says four points are non-collinear. Is that always, sometimes, or never true? Well, I'm just going to go with from a common sense point, is it always true that four points are never going to be in the same line? No. A line can contain an infinite amount of points. So because of this, this might be sometimes true. This is sometimes true just from a logical standpoint. I could draw four non-collinear points, but I could also draw four collinear points that all fall in the same line, right? So just from a logical standpoint, that's true. But also, we're going to use this 3.3. Oh, sorry, you can't see that. 3.3 says a line contains at least two points. In other words, it can contain four points. That's sometimes. 
a line can contain four points. But also what we drew there is a great explanation as well. Drawing works as well. Okay, this is good stuff. Uh, this is where we're going to stop for this video. On the next one, we're going to continue on with two-column proofs. Ready, set. <laughs> Peace out.